Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Christian Hurley. I am the executive director of the American Heart Association in Southeastern Michigan. And I am joined today uh, by Dr. Philip Levy, who will be sharing with us some exciting research that he's working on uh, currently. Hi, welcome, Phil. Hi, Christian. It's a pleasure to be on here with you and uh, looking forward to having a conversation about our grant and the other wonderful work we're doing here in Southeast Michigan. Absolutely. Well, you know, Phil, thank you. Thank you so much for being here with us today, you know, for being a donor, for being a volunteer leader uh, with the American Heart Association of Southeastern Michigan. We're so grateful uh, for all the time and resources that you use to support the American Heart Association. Um, before we get into some of the questions that we have for you today, would you mind sharing a little bit about yourself, your role at Wayne Health and Wayne State and kind of what you do there? Yeah, absolutely. I think before we uh, get into that, uh, you know, it's my pleasure to uh, have been and still be the board president for the Southeast Michigan American Heart Association. It's been going on now for uh, close to four years. Uh, I know that uh, my time as president is soon coming to an end, but uh, it has really been one of um, the, the best parts of my career in the last few years to be to be involved with this organization and to do all the wonderful work we do together. At Wayne State University, I am a professor of emergency medicine and also assistant vice president for translational science and clinical research innovation. I operate uh, this, um, uh, you know, this role out of our Integrated Biosciences Center, which is uh, the old Daglish Cadillac building right on Woodward in downtown Detroit, uh, a nice uh, renaissance story of the city and of this facility. And um, in this capacity, I oversee a lot of the clinical and translational research activities that occur uh, at the university. And uh, I'm also Chief Innovation Officer for Wayne Health, uh, which is the physician practice group that's affiliated with Wayne State University. And in that regard, I uh, have been developing population health outreach uh, and intervention programs, uh, uh, one of which we're going to talk about here. Wonderful. Oh, my gosh. Um, Dr. Levy, you're doing such incredible work. And, and again, yes, thank you so much. You've been such an amazing leader on our board of directors, and we are so excited to have you. And you're not done for quite a while, so don't, don't get excited about it. <laughs> and we're going to be getting you keeping you close even after that time. So I'll jump into some of these questions here. Um, Recently, the American Heart Association announced $20 million in funding for five scientific research teams. Each of these teams were tasked with finding new solutions for preventing high blood pressure. These research projects will be focusing on hypertension prevention in underserved populations with historically the highest prevalence of this mostly preventable but potentially deadly condition. Dr. Levy, you and your team were selected to be one of these teams and were, were awarded a significant research grant. Could you talk to me about your initiative, what you were funded to achieve, and sort of how you're going to go about putting these funds to work right here in southeastern Michigan? Uh, absolutely. So first and foremost, uh, the HERN or Health Equity Research Network uh, is a new initiative uh, from the American Heart Association. Uh, we had a great uh, call uh, the other day with Donald Lloyd-Jones. Uh, Dr. Jo uh, Lloyd-Jones is the president of the American Heart Association, the national uh, AHA, uh, and really emphasized that health equity and uh, a focus on high blood pressure as a part of that is a big uh, um, direction, not, not, not a shift per se, but an area of emphasis that the AHA is gonna be looking towards in the coming years. This particular HERN or Health Equity Research Network is focused on hypertension prevention. It's the first of the HERNs that will come out. And from what I understand, there's, there's upwards of 100 million plus uh, that the AHA is dedicating towards this vision, which is phenomenal and fantastic. Our particular effort uh, is uh, a five uh, institution collaboration. It's called Restore, which is the parent name of the network. And uh, NYU under uh, Dr. Benga Ogadegbe is the PI, the principal investigator of the program. And it involves uh, several different projects, five different projects that institutions like University of Alabama, Birmingham, Johns Hopkins, uh, Beth Israel Deaconess, 
NYU and Wayne State University. And Wayne State University's program is called LEAP Hypertension. And effectively, myself, Dr. Robert Brook, and several colleagues here at Wayne State working with the Wayne Health Mobile Health Unit Program, which I think we'll get into more detail on in a minute, uh, is design, uh, we've designed and uh, are implementing a program to use our mobile health outreach which was initially developed uh, for uh, testing and vaccination efforts as part of the COVID pandemic, but using this outreach to take care into the community and identify individuals who have elevated blood pressure. That means systolic blood pressure is uh, above 120, uh, but less than 129 millimeters of mercury and a diastolic blood pressure that's less than 80. So it's not quite meeting the criteria of high blood pressure, but we recognize that along the way to developing high blood pressure, there's a period of something called elevated blood pressure. And we know that below 120 is a normal blood pressure for the population. If the blood pressure is above that, even if it's not considered hypertensive, that puts folks at risk for developing high blood pressure, hypertension, but also the complications of hypertension because your blood pressure starts to creep up a little bit over time. And as it's creeping up over time, that is starting to cause some damage to the body, especially the kidneys, uh, can cause uh, small blood vessel damage in the brain and in the heart. And all of these things accumulate over time and produce the dramatic and drastic consequences that we know occur from things like high blood pressure. So our effort is really first and foremost to enhance access in the community using mobile outreach, taking our vehicle, our fleet of vehicles out to different neighborhoods, measuring blood pressure on folks who come and, and come up to the vehicle. It could be in the neighborhood where they live. It could be in uh, you know, the parking lot of where they work. We measure their blood pressure. And then if they meet the criteria, we engage them on, on potentially participating in the study. So access is the first thing that we're doing. But the second thing that we're doing is delivering intervention called PALS squared, which is personalized, pragmatic, adaptable approaches to lifestyle and life circumstance intervention. Yes, it was a lot of fun to come up with that acronym, you can bet, but the key feature in, in this is each word has, has meaning. And so the approaches we're looking to do really are set to be about what the individual wants and needs and, and thinks they can achieve and accomplish in an effort to, to lower blood pressure and effectively prevent them from progressing to hypertension. And along the way, we've recognized that the American Heart Association, Life Simple 7, it's a terrific paradigm for the goals that we should be you know, striving to achieve in population health. But oftentimes individuals, especially in communities like ours in Detroit, where you know, there are a lot of areas of social vulnerability and lower socioeconomic status, Life circumstances often preclude the ability to do the lifestyle changes that we know will have benefit. We want everyone to eat a low sodium dash type of diet, right? But if you're making a decision between putting food on your table or buying your prescriptions or buying books for your kids for school or whatever it might be, you're not so worried about the sodium content of the food you're putting on the table. You're just, you just want to have enough to feed your family. And so what we're trying to do is to say, okay, if we find people who have these risk you know, this risk profile because their blood pressure is elevated. Can we work with them around all of the different components of their life and their life circumstances to address things like food insecurity, housing insecurity, um, you know, foreclosures and evictions that fall into the housing insecurity, utilities, those types of things. We can support the person in the things that stress their life and de-stress their life will have a lot better opportunity to make changes and, and support them on their journey to, you know, enhance their lifestyle and improve their health outcomes. That's incredible. I mean, just absolutely incredible, this work uh, that you're doing right here in our community, uh, Dr. Levy. And I, I wonder if you could double click a bit on, you know, you talked a little bit about this network that the American Heart Association has put together and that, you know, yes, we've invested this 20 million, but 100 million is coming, right? In this focus on health equity and particularly around hypertension. Can you share just a little bit more? Why high blood pressure? Why is the, 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 why is this the area that everyone or that the AHA and you and your team has decided that this is the thing that if we can make an impact on um, we can make a real difference. And then what is the important criteria? I think you, you, you touched on it with some of the, the, the things you were sharing about the social factors, right? But the idea that you're coupling this with mobile health, you mm -hmm. know, could you dig in a little bit more into that, you know, why high blood pressure and then how that mobile factor really makes a difference as well? 
Yeah, absolutely. So high blood pressure is the single most important population attributable health risk for heart disease, period. A lot of things go into high blood pressure, genetics, smoking, obesity, a lack of, you know, diet, however you want to think about it. But it doesn't matter how you get to high blood pressure. Having high blood pressure, if not treated and adequately controlled, will cause problems in your body that will last for a lifetime and may even kill you. Things mm -hmm. like cerebrovascular disease causing a stroke, things like early onset heart disease causing heart attacks or heart failure, kidney disease, the things that we all want to prevent. Because once you damage an organ, it doesn't get undamaged. And so if you have small little blood vessels that get injured because your blood pressure is high in your brain, the cells that those blood vessels feed are going to die and you never get that function back. And when that occurs in cognitive areas of your brain, you can get things like multi-infarct dementia. You can get small vessel dementia. So accumulated insults over time causing big clinical damage uh, that you know changes your life. And so we recognize that high blood pressure being this important risk factor is critical. But the other thing about high blood pressure is that it's inherently treatable in about 90% of the people. Not that the other 10% are untreatable, they're just harder to treat. So if we have a condition that affects more people that least leads to having heart disease and, and cerebrovascular disease and kidney disease and more people than anything, it makes sense to focus on that. And in particular here in Detroit, um, you know, we, we have a predominant black population in the city of Detroit, 82, 84%, depending on, you know, what data you look at. And we know that the black population suffers disproportionately from high blood pressure, not only the onset of high blood pressure, the development of it, but the control of it. And a lot of that has to do with some genetic predisposition, but that's not what we're talking about here. A lot of it has to do with all the life circumstances that we just mentioned, because those life circumstances tend to afflict people of lower socioeconomic status. And unfortunately, in urban America, you know, the black population uh, tends to be most affected by this. And so really the question isn't, you know, how, how do we reach these, you know, these people? Why do we want to focus on this population? It's more so how do we deliver the, the services and meet the needs of the population we're trying to, uh, to, to help? And, and so one of the, you know, the primary things that contributes to this is poor access to healthcare. Whether it's poor access because there's just not enough doctors or facilities in the area where someone lives, or somebody works a job, two jobs that they can't get time off of, and it makes it difficult to take a, a you know half a day where you're not going to get paid to go see your physician uh, or nurse practitioner, whomever you're getting care from. And, and so what we're trying to do is say, can we remove that barrier? to access by taking taking it mobile by bringing vehicles to you know a, a, a neighborhood uh, parking lot near where you live a McDonald's we were at the McDonald's right here you know on Mac and 75 the last couple of days doing covid vaccinations and testing but also measuring blood pressures and checking cholesterol and looking at uh, you know kidney disease and kidney function and, and so it's really that concept if we take care to people and we make that care just part of routine daily living, it doesn't become something special that they need to manage. It becomes something that, you know, I'll go get my cup of coffee from McDonald's and I'll get my blood pressure and get that taken care of too while I'm there. And that's kind of the, the you know, the, the, the shift that we're really trying to, to drive, no pun intended, with our mobile health outreach. And one of the other pieces, which I didn't mention, but that's kind of consistent across the network. And one of the advantages of having a network like this is that we see a lot of this care shift occurring with community health workers being the primary point of contact for people. So it's not that community health workers are able to do what a physician does, it's that they are able to do what a physician doesn't do, which is most important, right? I can talk to a patient about their social challenges, their, their barriers, but I can't really do anything about them. I mean, I can give them money, you know, from my pocket, but if somebody tells me, you know, they, they're underemployed, they're underinsured, they have poor access to food, I'm the worst person in the equation to try to solve that problem. Let's get somebody who's lived the experience of that individual, who knows the, the resources and can connect that person to those resources. And nobody does that better than community health workers, you know, especially highly trained uh, and, and skilled community health workers who know how to do motivational interviewing who know how to reach people to identify what those barriers are. And so where we are going with all of this, with our PAL squared model, our enhanced access with mobile health units and community health workers is trying to empower people to, to work with someone who they can trust 
to help them get to where they need to be. And that's really the, you know, the big design difference that we're doing. And again, what's beautiful about having a network of four other centers is that Three of the projects across the network are using community health workers. All of the projects focus on different ways to enhance access. And we can have a lot of synergy across the network and, and take these individual projects and, and create some homogeny, not only in the approach, but also in data and data sharing. And we can really take you know, what normally would be one small or medium-sized project in isolation and connect it with other projects so that you can force multiply and get, you know, get economies of scale, both for interventions and design, but also for data. In incredible. I mean, the things that you mentioned, um, you know, really meeting people where they are. Like, I, I absolutely love that you're in a McDonald's parking lot, you know, taking blood pressures, but that's where people are, right? And so taking that opportunity to really truly be in and of the community is so, so incredibly important. And, and is that the, the concept of tying in with the community health workers? Is that the piece in your grant where you're really personalizing the care and, and really ensuring that it, it works for them. Is that what you mean when you talked about doing a personalized health plan? Yeah, so oftentimes we try to fit people into one thing in healthcare. This is the way this gets managed. And we know people are different and people have their own their own issues. I don't mean that in a pejorative. I just mean people have the, their own things they're dealing with. And you have to make sure that what you're trying to help someone with is the problem that they face, mm -hmm. right? So I can go out and say, yes, there is a lot of poverty in Detroit and everyone needs food and, and do that, but that's not the case, right? Some people need food and some people don't. And the best person to tell you what they need is the person you're trying to help. And so, you know, the, the CHW is really uh, sort of the conduit to get that information. Who is that person you're trying to help gonna be most comfortable sharing their needs with? It's very hard in some circumstances. People don't wanna advertise that they're impoverished. People don't wanna say they can't support their family. And especially to you know somebody who they may perceive will have a judgment component in there, like a physician or a healthcare provider. I'm not saying that you know we go into the equation judging people, but there are inherent biases. Implicit bias we know is a very important thing uh, in, in healthcare and there's a lot of trainings, especially in the state of Michigan, to mitigate or you know reduce the impact of that. But it doesn't it doesn't matter you know um, what we do around that. You have to find that comfort zone for that person. And what we've experienced in our prior work, what the data show you know from other uh, efforts around this are that community health workers, again, individuals who look and sound like the people they're trying to help and have lived that experience. Can, can make all the difference. You establish the trust because this person isn't saying, yeah, that kind of sucks. You're, you know, you're, you're poor. I hope that works out for you. Right. Now, yeah, not saying I say that because I want to, I just can't help that circumstance. They can help that person and say, yeah, I live this too. I, I suffer from the same kind of circumstance you do, but this is what I did. And these are the resources that you can get. And so, you know, it goes back to one of the the uh, current and you know older AHA statements, right? Meeting people where they're at, but it's not just where they're at physically, it's where they're at mentally, it's where they're at in their journey uh, to try to get healthy and well. And one of the things that the LEAP Hypertension Project is focused on uh, is younger people, because we're looking at folks with elevated blood pressure, not yet hypertension. Uh, and people who have not yet developed consequences of that, that tends to be the group that's younger. And so we're trying to, to shift the model and say a 25 or 30 year old, you know, black man or woman who's got a blood pressure of 128 millimeters of mercury wouldn't be diagnosed with hypertension, but they're still a high risk patient that needs support and care. And if we can keep that blood pressure at 128 or lower it down to 125 or 122 or whatever the number is, we're going to reduce the likelihood that they're going to develop hypertension and reduce the likelihood they're going to suffer consequences. From that, they can live a longer, healthier, happier life. And that really is the ultimate goal. How can we enhance the lifespan equality of our population? How can we ensure that our community doesn't die 10 or 12 years younger because we didn't have the temerity to go in and, and start to address the problems way ahead of time? Wow. Um, I, I think, you know, some of the things that jumped out to me is that the, the age uh, question, you know, I think so often when people think of high blood pressure, they think of it as, you know, an elderly, you know, condition, and that's just not the case. And I think because of that, 
of imagery, you know, people don't prioritize kind of knowing their numbers and taking care of it. And so again, that just is another reason why what you're doing and you're with your, particularly with this mobile effort, reaching people at all walks of life in our community is so critical. You know, you talked a lot about some of the unique challenges in Detroit um, and that, you know, we face you know, first of all, we are you know an African American community in the city of Detroit. Um, that we might have some social factors that are also exacerbating some of the poor outcomes that we're seeing. Why is it important to do a project like this here? And you know, you know, what are some of the issues that are affecting us uniquely? And you know, from that, how do you see a, pro a program like this kind of being taken to scale and affecting other communities? How does this research affect us in other parts of the state and other parts of the country? Well, you know, I'll say this, there's, there's um, always and obviously unique characteristics to any community, but there's not a lot that is outlier unique to Detroit versus other urban, you know, impoverished communities that have a predominant, uh, you know, population of minorities, especially black individuals. This, what's happening in Detroit happens in Memphis. It happens in Newark. It happens in, you know, areas of, of LA. You pick the big city. This is the same problem. I just happen to be here and we happen to be here. So it works out very well, but my motivation behind this and the motivation behind the project is the fact that in Detroit, um, the community is is twice as likely to die of heart disease uh, than the rest of the United States. And again, you know, the same numbers would be in place if we looked at these other communities. But, you know, it's almost 300 people per 100,000 in age adjusted mortality that are going to die from heart disease compared to about 150 in the rest of the United States, you know, on, on, on the whole. And equally important, if not more important, is that folks, when they get um, heart disease and die from it in Detroit and other communities that are similar, they die younger. So it's not just the, the disproportionate death rate, it's the years of potential life lost. So how many years not achieving up to age 75, right, were lost uh, because of this. And when that happens, it saps vibrancy from the communities, it takes grandparents away from grandkids, it takes, you know, mothers away from their children, it takes dollars away from the tax base. It takes employees away from employers. It does so much that's detrimental to the community. And in some ways, you know, it, it really um, creates a, an environment where illness is sort of perceived as inevitable rather than something that can be avoided or prevented. And that's what this is really about, convincing people that if they focus on things that they normally wouldn't focus on early, like elevated blood pressure, and they see a trustworthy, you know, advocate and, and, and partner in this journey, like Wayne Health, Wayne State, but our CHWs, community health workers in particular, they're more likely to want to take control of the circumstances to the degree they can, find the support structure for the other circumstances that are challenging, and get into a better place so that we can all you know, cherish the fact that we've enhanced the, you know, the lifespan of our population through efforts to promote equality and care delivery and, uh, and addressing social service needs. Wow. Um, you know, that's just incredibly impactful. And, and as you said, it really is it's a game changer and, you know, solving this problem, particularly in Detroit, you know, we've often talked about how in Detroit, the lifespan, like you, you, you have 16 more years of life. Mm -hmm. If you're born in say gross point farms, uh, as opposed to, you know, maybe midtown Detroit. And so it sounds like, you know, this initiative is really, you know, t centering in on that concept and, and affecting um, one of the most important or the most important risk factor for for heart disease um, and stroke. And so, gosh, thank you so much for this research that you're doing, that you're doing right here in our community. We are so um, excited that we can be uh, a, you know, a part of this and be able to fund this amazing work that you're doing um, at Wayne State and Wayne Health. So, so Christian, I, when you say, you know, we, I just want to make sure that people are tuning in, especially our, our supporters, understand that this we is the grand we. We can't do any of this work without everybody who believes in the mission of what we're doing. Mm -hmm. And I think highlighting as we are here, how the support of the American Heart Association directly impacts our local population is critical. And, you know, I know you and I talk about this all the time, but I, but I think it's great, you know, for us to recognize that, that contribution and, and the the, the partnership we have with our supporters. And so, you know, I think as you and I talk about all the time, you know, we're so grateful to have 
to have that that type of philanthropy and support for what we do. And and uh, you know, I just want to make sure, uh, as we both you know do, that that uh, everybody recognizes how important they are uh, you know in in this um, this effort. Absolutely, and thank you for sharing that. It is absolutely it takes a village, right? Yeah. Uh, that it takes we, a city. we really. <laughs> We are working, it takes a city, it takes a village. We are working together and absolutely um, without our donors supporting us, we would never have been able to support you at the level that we've been able to with this grant. And so we're very grateful for that. Um, before I, uh, I let you go, um, we also, I wanted to also ask you about something else I was reading about that is just super incredible. Um, you, it looks like you are a part of our, uh, the work that we're doing nationally to provide new guidelines for chest pain. Um, I know that you are a part of this group. Uh, it's a combination of the American College of Cardiology and the American Heart Association's Joint Committee on clinical practice guidelines. And that just recently there were some new uh, criteria, some new guidelines that came out and you were a part of that nationally. So I just thought while we have you, if you wouldn't mind sharing a little bit about that experience, you know, helping to build those guidelines for our nation. And then, you know, what are some of the new guidelines and how will they impact individuals here in Southeastern Michigan? Yeah, I'm delighted to talk about those before we leave the topic of the mobile units and, and outreach. You know, for anyone who's listening, um, I hope that the conceptual model we're describing um, provides uh, impetus and, and stimulates thought about how this model could be leveraged for other things. You know, one of the things that we are focused on is women's health issues uh, and making sure that our vehicles can help solve issues and, and problems related to preterm birth and, and, and pregnancy outcomes. And, you know, the reason why I want to just emphasize that briefly before we go on mm -hmm. is there's not a single person on this planet that didn't start within a woman. And if we don't emphasize the health of women, we can never emphasize enough the health of, of everybody else. And so keeping women healthy, keeping their, their babies healthy while they're pregnant is key. Having our mobile outreach go into communities where we know there's high preterm birth is important, uh, but also working with organizations like Alternatives for Girls and First Candle to create opportunities for women to get easy access for services is really going to be key. So I just didn't want to leave that you know, alone. Uh, and I think it's an important point of emphasis. You know, Our mobile units are all over the state. We were the first group into Benton Harbor when they were talking about about, you know, potential lead toxicity due to the pipes. And we continue to do this all over the state. Uh, the state of Michigan has developed a robust infrastructure of mobile health units as part of the racial disparities task force from the COVID pandemic. And so just, you know, everyone tuning in here should know the state of Michigan is really leading the nation in this type of thinking. And so, you know, we're very fortunate to have the support of our state uh, and, and uh, you know, its, it's leadership. Getting, getting back to the guidelines, I'm sorry. No, I just I just wanted to say thank you for bringing that up. You know, um, one of the things I was also just reading is that, you know, the American Heart Association kind of puts out a top 10 list of research that has impacted, you know, that's making a, the biggest uh, difference in communities or, you know, information that we're learning. And so what's the top 10 things in research in 2020? And, and one of those things, I believe it was number four, was about high blood pressure in pregnant women. Yeah. And so I'm so excited to hear that this project and the work that you're doing with mobile health in our city is actually making an impact of that on that and that you have source resources that can also affect women in general, but particularly pregnant women who are dealing with high blood pressure. Ab absolutely. Um, and, you know, if you think about it, it's, it's a community that already has greater risk for high blood pressure, mm -hmm. that already has superimposed additional social circumstance risks. And, you know, you put all of that on a young woman uh, in her first or second pregnancy, and you could see why it's, it's a problematic circumstance. And so, you know, we are uh, delighted to be able to take our mobile program and apply it to, you name it, circumstance and, and you know, perhaps you know, beyond the general concept of hypertension, you know, focusing on women's health, uh, there, there's no better role for, for this type of outreach and, and enhanced access. So, but, but getting back to the guidelines, um, I'll say this, it was a journey. This started four years ago, and I was estimating that I probably put in about five or 600 hours of my time into this. I was vice chair uh, of the guidelines. Martha Galati uh, was chair, uh, myself and uh, uh, Deb Mukherjee, a cardiologist uh, from uh, uh, Texas uh, were the vice chairs. And so we basically had a, a writing panel of almost 25 people and had to herd a lot of cats 
uh, and goats and any other word you want to throw in there for trying to get this many people this engaged for this long of a period of time. Um, it was a lot of work to come up with the guidelines, but it was driven by the motivation to enhance the way we manage chest pain everywhere. So chest pain is one of the, the most common reasons why people go into the emergency department and everyone who goes in thinks it's their heart. Fortunately, 95% of the time it's not, but we don't know that just by talking to a person when they come in. I can't tell just by the way you describe your chest pain, by the way you describe other symptoms that may be associated with it you know, if it is indeed your heart or not, things uh, like other risk factors, age, diabetes, high blood pressure, again, coming back to that, high cholesterol, smoking, obesity, all of these things increase the likelihood of developing coronary artery disease. This is what we're really talking about with chest pain are the blood vessels that feed the heart blocked. And if they are, let's go in and open them up with a cardiac catheterization. That's sort of the treatment paradigm that, you know, that exists. But what typically happens is that you get people who come to the ER and because there's uncertainty around what may be causing the chest pain and there's fear on the part of physicians about missing a cardiac cause, um, it, a, a very conservative approach is taken where if you go to the ER and you're a 50 year old male like myself and I report chest pain, I'm gonna get admitted to the hospital or stay overnight or something because there's fear about malpractice. There's fear about missing the case. And I don't mean that, you know, they, it's always in that order, right? Uh, but, it, you know, both of those play into it. And so what these guidelines do is they call for, first of all, recognition that chest pain isn't always just pain in the chest. Someone who complains with shortness of breath or chest discomfort, you know, those words matter just because they don't say pain doesn't mean it's not your heart. But then we run through a whole list of things from that first presentation and about what you should do all the way through uh, comp complicated, uh, you know, uh, uh, high risk patients, and then transcends from the acute care emergency department space to the outpatient space. Basically, when someone comes into an office, how should you approach their chest pain? And one of the things we emphasize is using standardized risk assessment tools, so that it's not you know, ambiguous based on the, the whims or the understanding or the predilections of the physician treating you, you have a standard that you should achieve. We define for the first time in acute chest pain what low risk really is. And the consensus is that if you have less than a 1% chance of having an adverse outcome in 30 days, you're considered low risk. And being able to definitively say you are low risk is a very valuable thing. It's reassuring to patients. And by saying, and giving clinicians a recommendation that they can hang their hat on, it gives them security to be able to say, yes, you can go home, which is really important. Equally important is that we strongly emphasize the concept of shared decision-making with patients. So it's not just, you know, I come in and see you as a doctor for the first five minutes, and then I never see you again. And then the nurse comes in and two hours later, and I know everyone on this call has experienced this in the ER, nurse comes in two hours later, says you're tested negative and you can go home. And you're like, huh, what the heck is going on here? What's my problem, right? What's wrong with me? Having a doctor come back in the room and emphasize explaining to the patient what 1% risk really means or less and explaining to the patient what should happen next and then working with the patient to have acceptability around that shared decision. It's going to create much better opportunities for patients, again, to be involved in their own care, uh, mm -hmm. but for physicians to ensure that they're not just making suppositions and, and determinations of what should happen to the patient without engaging the patient in that conversation. And then, you know, we have all sorts of pathways in there that talk about if you're not low risk, what should happen next, what tests you should use for what patient population. If it's not your heart, what other things should you be thinking about? And, you know, it, it, it really, I would say is a labor of love that, that we put in all this time and effort to get it, you know, across the goal line. The first time um, this went out for peer review, we had 1800 comments that came back to us. And Martha, Deb and I sat there for hours and went through each comment because each one had to be responded to line by line. We did that, then it went out again to another round of review and another couple of hundred comments and just back and forth all the time. But we never lost sight of the goalpost, which was to create a document that would be really patient centric with actionable information for clinicians. A lot of if this, then that, which will really create a roadmap for how patients with chest pain should be cared for in the country. That's incredible. You know, and when even things that you're sharing, like sending it out for peer review, I mean, here you are already a leader in this field, obviously working on this, but the fact that it's going out to so many other leaders and 
physicians and clinicians around the nation and the world and asking their feedback on this so that, you know, this is what we mean when we say, you know, the, the work that comes from the American Heart Association and our partners is science based. Right. And, and, and it is it is it is soundly developed um, under the greatest science minds in our nation, in our world. So thank you so much for being a part of that process. You know, this work is incredible. And it actually, I feel, ties into the talk discussion we've had around equity. These mm -hmm. guidelines advocate ad equity when physicians have clear cut things that they can share with each patient not based on, you know, their life and, you know, environment or their racial makeup, those symptoms, they come in with that and they have these tangible guidelines. It does support equitable treatment within our hospital systems and clinical environments. And part of the support for that equitable treatment is the accountability that comes with a standard mm -hmm. so that it doesn't matter which facility you go to, and it doesn't matter the color of the patient or the race or ethnicity of the patient you're taking care of. We actually emphasize in here very strongly the different nuances amongst women versus men, because women tend to get um, lesser or less aggressive therapy when, when perhaps they should get more aggressive therapy or intervention. And across races too, we know that uh, cultural sensitivity and understanding the, the language and the words that different populations use is critically important. If if I'm trying to understand what it is you're trying to tell me, I have to speak your language. And that doesn't mean, you know, we speak different languages. It's just what what's the vernacular that one community uses versus another. And, you know, it doesn't uh, it, if you don't know that, if you don't have that awareness, it's going to be very hard to, you know, to uh, to deliver the best care every time. And that's really what this is about. Set the standards so that the right care is delivered every time for each patient and that you don't let people fall through the cracks because someone didn't know better. Mm -hmm. Well, this has just been an uh, incredibly informative and dynamic conversation, Dr. Levy. Thank you so much for taking another hour of your time to work with the American Art Association. Uh, we are grateful for you and just, again, so happy that we can contribute to the incredible work that you're doing uh, here in Metro Detroit. So thank you for being here. Thank you for your leadership. I'm so glad that you'll still be a part and be our board president through June. So uh, we, we look forward to that and continue working with you. So thank you so much. Thank you for being here. This was wonderful. Thank you, Christian, for highlighting this work, not just because it's the work we're leading, but because it's work that's really important for the people we care for. Absolutely. Thank you. You're welcome.